Ah, please turn your computers off. This is installing an update. Ah, uh, okay, let it go. But everybody else. Uh, one thing I do want to say is if you want to take notes with a computer, some people like to do that. There's a website called Evernote. Helps you organize notes. Kind of interesting. You might want to check it out. Or maybe you're just going to take them in Google Docs. You're welcome to keep a computer on, but you gotta sit in the front row. And then you just need to take notes. It's not like you get to take notes and Facebook. It's just for taking notes. So if you want to use a computer for that, you can do, do that. Uh, all right, well, uh, I want to point out one thing to you guys. You want to hit the front lights for me there? Thanks. And uh, Blackboard, under extra credit, and under the Fresno City College Oscars, I changed the name to the Fresno City College Oscars because I think that's going to look better on your resume if you win the Fresno City College Oscars as opposed to the CIT 15 Oscars. You can now click a link to see the current Fresno City College Oscar contenders. And there's one so far. All right, so that's the competition so far if you're thinking of making a video that's going to be a contender. I just want to be a contender. I want to go the distance. I don't want to be a chump. Adrian! No? No? You guys know what movie I'm referencing? Rocky. Yeah, thank you, Rocky. All right, then the other thing I want to point out under lectures is under lectures to watch, you've got the lectures that have been happening in class. First lecture, week one. Lecture two, week two. Week two, lecture two. So you can see those. And then you can also see the videos that are shown in class. All right, so I'm kind of keeping them in, uh, what do you call it? I was going to say synchronicial order, but I don't think that's a word. What kind of order would that be? That would be chronological order. Thank you. That's the word I'm looking for. And I was a little torn about showing you all this thing behind the Great Firewall of China because I think it's an interesting video, but just based upon kind of what we were talking about, uh, you know, I almost don't want to show you guys like these videos because I think they'd be great in a couple of weeks, but they just engage me quite a bit. So what do you want to do? You want to see the Great Firewall of China and then hear the, the one on like revolutionizing education on Wednesday? Or you want to go with these other ones that are kind of more along the mind, lines of pluses and minuses and this one's kind of Wow, a show. I, I should probably show it now because there's some of you that are going to drop out in a week or two, so it would be good for you to see it. Like, seriously, what the hell? Why are there four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve empty seats? What's that about? So we got 21. That's pretty good. I commend you guys for showing up. Give me your thoughts on that later. All right, here's your incentive video for getting to class on time. Uh, it's actually a three-part video because, like, I'm going to build an argument. We'll start with the best one. And uh, hit the whole lights, please. Okay, pretty cool, huh? Uh, go ahead and hit the backlights, please. Uh, what do you guys think? I hit them all, hit the all lights. Anybody have any thoughts on that video? Is it 
talked about this happening in Europe. Is this happening in the United States as well? Or I don't know. Does anybody know anything about that? It's happening in Europe, right? The European Union Data Directive of 2006. Have anybody heard anything about whether or not it's happening in America? Uh, I think it is happening in America. What? It's been happening for a long time. I don't know. That's right. Okay. You got any, uh, is that just your sense or you heard something? You remember the source? Uh, I've heard about it somewhere. I don't really yeah. Know. Yeah. Anybody else have any thoughts on that one? Or an answer? Um, I was going to say, like, sure, that's the negative aspect of it, but even, like, over there, you can't, I think about here, like, all the positive things as far as, like, uh, crimes that are done and how much they use that surveillance and that close, like, to the home. So, but usually you only hear, like, the crazy or listening to us kind of thing. Right, right. Yeah. They could turn our phones on here at any time, whatever we're saying. Know where we are. Fox News did have a, a story. I don't, I'm not a big section out of Fox News. I saw it on the internet. But Fox News did have a story that the FBI can listen to you anytime, anyway, even when your phone is off. So that's the source. Thank you for what it is. And, uh, you know, so have you heard they're used for crime? Catching well, criminals? Uh, yeah, I mean, like, if you ever see, like, on um, like a, any, any type of, like, um, kidnapping or some type of thing, it's like they're always using cell phones now to, yeah. you know, like, if there wasn't those records, then or yeah. tracing, tracing people or tracing certain yeah. things, like, I understand that. Yeah, yeah. so if a, if a bank gets robbed, hey, we could just look who was in the bank, because our cell phone, cell phones, and point us to that exact location. So if you're a criminal, or if you know criminals, you want to share with them that they should not be taking their cell phones with them when they're doing crime. Take somebody else's cell phone. Take a cell phone you stole. Then it'll look like someone else is there. I don't know if they could use it. I don't know how much they can listen. I don't know how much they can track us. I uh, do know that that capability exists. I don't know what extent's used. I do know that they need they used to need, I don't know how it's changed after the Patriot Act, and who's going to disagree with that? Because if you disagree with the Patriot Act, you must not be a Patriot, right? You're not a Patriot, you disagree with the Patriot Act. It's kind of Orwellian, but I do know after the Patriot Act a lot of freedoms were taken, but that's a trade-off between security and freedom. Give you more security, but you got to take away more freedom. And uh, so I, I also know that they do not need a wiretap for listening to cellular data. It's not going through wire, it's going through the air. And they can just grab that and listen to it. And that there's an agency called the National Security Agency, NSA I think it's called. I think that's what it stands for. And they, uh, they monitor cellular traffic, they monitor internet traffic, no emails are private, everything is Watch. I think I shared the example of sending a fake email, you know, whether or not it'll come up on someone's radar. How many people, is that disconcerting to you at all? Is it, oh, you think that's maybe not so positive? When you see your hands, you think, that could be bad news in the wrong hands. That could be bad news in the wrong hands, yeah. And there's been plenty of instances throughout history where people have used information for bad purposes. So 1984 is a reference to that, I think, when the guy said he was, grew up 1984. I don't think he was born in 1984. Maybe he was. He doesn't look quite that young to me. But. So 1984 was a book written by George Orwell. You guys know George Orwell? About Big Brother watching us living in a sort of state where we're always monitored. And uh, then in 1989, the Berlin Wall fell. So that was like Eastern Europe, the start of the end of Eastern Europe. So. And cellular phones allow, in connectivity, allow all kinds of protests which might not have occurred otherwise, right? Like we kind of saw with Syria, you know, or people networking. So pluses and minuses. But interesting stuff and kind of interesting to think about. They know who you talk to. They know where you are. They know when you sleep. They know where you sleep, whoever they are. 
right, that that data can be out there. I remember reading somewhere a long time ago that it's computers generated on their own if you use like 100 of keywords, like bomb, president, or something. Yeah. It records it, and if it keeps the record, if it keeps happening, then I guess it, I don't know if it notifies somebody to kind of yeah. tap into more detail or whatever, but that's what I heard a long time ago. Yeah, About 100 keywords that you can use, bomb, president, stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, 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 very true. I think that is the way it happens. They have computers kind of screening things. Um, so there's this one other video. I am signed in, man. Aren't I? I thought I was. I guess I got there from here. Uh, this is a pretty cool movie. I'll show you the trailer at the end of class. It's called The Lives of Others, and it's about a guy who's a Stasi police officer in East Berlin monitoring people, and he's hearing and you know gaining insight into the lives of others. A uh, pretty great movie, so if you're interested in film, that kind of a deal, something that's kind of along these lines. And there's the trailer for 1984, too. So if there's time at the end of the class, I'll show you guys those two things. Anybody have, have any final thoughts or comments about that? How many people liked that video? Like, oh, that was kind of cool to see. How many people did not like it? How many people like coming to class and seeing a video the first thing, generally? How many people do not like it? Right. Okay, so let's take a look at that chapter one paper and then... We'll see a little bit more about what we've been learning about computers, and then if we've got some time, we'll do some working on your stuff. But first, the reading of the cards. So uh, somebody turned in a card, and there's nothing written on it. So what were the instructions when you turn in cards? What are you supposed to do? It's supposed to be your name. It's supposed to be the day, the date. So it would be Monday, 8. 27 is that today? Todd McLeod, that'd be my name, it'd be at the top. I'd write a legible so I could see it, and then some thought about the class. So don't forget to write, like, hey, this is what I'm getting out of the class. I want to hear that. I want to see what you guys are getting out of the class. And when you turn in assignments, you know, give me your thoughts on the assignment, or if you learned something, share that. Because I want to I want to see how things are, are working for you. So don't forget to write stuff. All right. So it's Kyle here. Yep. Kyle. Today I leave this class with a stronger sense of caution towards the future and the new advancements in technology. I know, it just keeps going back and forth. Positive, negative, positive, negative. All right, tell me when to stop, Kyle. Yeah, uh, go ahead. Name. Name. Today I learned that nowadays people can use technology to kill anyone. Also, if you know the code, you control the world, not the 3D printing. You can print out guns or anything. It's just how you use technology as a tool. You can even use biotechnology to do bad things or good. Excellent name. Okay. Today is my birthday and it sucked. <laughs> Where's Diana? Right here. Is it getting better? Yeah, it Did it get better? Yeah, it was I'm sorry. Happy birthday, belated. <laughs> and she kind of gave us a list of stuff. 3D printing, creating a human kidney, handgun, etc. was an aspect of technology I was completely ignorant of. Could be both extremely dangerous and very useful. Scary stuff. Yeah, interesting world, crazy world, wacky world. All right, Diana. I like how Diana is like done with the cards. Great. <laughs> Cool. All right, so your chapter one page. Anybody not have it? Okay, we'll pass them down there. Pass them down there. Pass them down there. Pass them down there. There you go. Anybody else? Else, else. Wow. After that video, I was 
kind of interesting to go to look and see what Open Data City is, you know, see what else is at that website. All right, so what is computer literacy? Anybody know? Uh. Understanding how the computer works. Perfect, right? Understanding how a computer runs. So to be literate means that you're conversant, fluent, in something. So to be have computer literacy, to be literate with computers means things. It means you uh, you understand how computers work and and uh, the role they play, and you're able to use them with a certain amount of ability. So you're compute, you're you're literate. You have computer literacy. So what computers do? Data versus information. Anybody find information? Or anybody come up with what that is? Data versus information. You probably would have found it. So data versus information is kind of what computers do. They take data, they turn it into information. So data might be what is the score, all the scores that you've gotten on all the assignments and the quizzes and the final and blackboard, right? And information would be what's your grade in the class. So it calculates your grade. It takes all that data and calculates your grade. Data would be the age of each of you in the class. And then I could ask the computer to give me the average age, and it'd calculate that, and that would give me information. So data, computers take data and turn it into information. right? And that could also be, here's all these zeros and ones, and then we play it, and it's a video of Nickelback that we watch. right? So it's taking data and giving us information. Uh, there's two sides of the coin when we talk about computers. There's hardware and software. So academics, humans, like to categorize good, bad, hot, cold, fast, slow, stupid, smart, I like that kind, I don't like that kind, truck, sports car, old car, new car, luxury, sedan. Right, we like to categorize stuff as humans. And so we're going to look at some of the categorizations when we start talking about technology. What are some of the different categories that things in technology fall into? One category, hardware. Another category, software. They're two sides of the same coin. Hardware doesn't work without software. Software doesn't work without hardware. Okay? So this crap you see before you that's physically hard, those are, that's hardware. The monitor is hardware, the keyboard is hardware, the mouse is hardware, the motherboard, the CPU, hardware, right? And then the software is what's running on that hardware, okay? So that would be Microsoft Word, Excel, Google, YouTube, that's all software. So hardware and software, two categorizations. And then we break software down into system software and application software break software down into system software and application software. So that's the next little thing there. So I like to think of that kind of like little nodes. Hardware, software, and then underneath software, software gets broken into system software, application software. Okay? Application software, an application is, hey, I'm just going to have my computer do this kind of an application. I'm going to apply my computer towards playing a game. I'm going to apply my computer. Here's an application that allows me to, uh, you know, fly the unmanned predator drone. That's a cool application. Here's an application that allows me to keep track of my personal finances. Here's an application that allows me to do some typing, word processing. Here's an application that allows me to manage and track a lot of information. It's a database. Now, those are all applications. They're things we generally use the computers for, right? Uh, my, I was going to say MySpace. What the hell is MySpace? Facebook, right? You know, whatever, right? Like, uh, whatever you use your computer for, you're generally applying it to some purpose or using an application. Uh, system software, on the other hand, is the software that makes your system run. So system software would include your operating system. So you might want to write OS under system software. It's your OS. It also includes your utilities. So your utilities are like kind of your utilities in your house. 
If your house needs utilities to run well without running without water coming into your house, without electricity, without gas, without sewage being taken away, without the trash being picked up, all those utilities that keep your house running well, your house is not going to run well. Right? Likewise, without utilities in your computer, your computer's not going to run well. So what are the utilities in the computer? Antivirus program is a utility. Uh, disk cleanup, disk defragmenter. You know, so those are kind of utilities. All right, so your system software consists of your operating system, your utilities, and your drivers. Drivers, what's a driver? Just another piece of software that knows how to drive another piece of hardware. So those printers back there, let's say we buy a printer at a yard sale, and the guy says, man, you know what, this printer's only five bucks, why is the printer only five bucks? I don't have the software that came with it. You're like, shoot, no problem, I'll just download it, here's your five bucks. You go home with your new printer, you look online, it's an HP, you look up that model on HP's website, hp.com, there's a big link that says drivers, right? And you can download the driver, the piece of software for your operating system that will tell your computer with this operating system how to drive that printer, how to make it work. So that's a driver. Really good to know about, because if something's not working, hey, my computer doesn't know how to make this printer work. Go download the most current driver for your operating system and install it, and then your computer will probably know how to make that printer work. How many people have done something like that before? How many people have never done anything like that before and never heard of it? And how many people are totally confused about what the hell I'm talking about? Anybody want to see me look up a driver? Will that help you? Yeah? All right! Ugh. So I go to HP's website, here's HP, and look, there's a huge link, support and drivers, woo! What's that printer back there? Somebody read the, the model number off that printer. Laserjet P4015N. Laserjet P4015N. 4015N. So I search for that, and then here, right, English, you know, here's all the download drivers and software. English, I go to my operating system. I'm running Windows 7, 32-bit or 64-bit. Ah, I don't know. Ah! Is it the North American Swallow or the South American Swallow? I don't know. Ah! No? You guys never saw Monty Python? Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay, there we go. So how do you find out? You go to start, you right click your computer, you choose properties. You right click your computer, that little thing right there, you choose properties. And I am running Windows 7 Enterprise and it is a Intel Core 2.7 32-bit operating system. Windows 7 32-bit. It would say 64-bit right there. So I download that one right there. And that's going to be the piece of software for my computer with my operating system that will tell me how to drive that printer. So, there you go. So when we break software down, we break it into application software and system software. When we break system software down, we break it into ooh, operating system. What's number two? Utilities. Utilities. What's number three? The drivers. drivers. And some people even throw translators in there. We're not going to worry about it. IPOS with the possibility of a little c. IPOS, what's IPOS? We talked about this last week. It's not iPod, it's IPOS with an S. What is that? Is the OS operating system? Mm, often yes, but not in this situation. Good guess. An IP is often an internet protocol, but again, not in this situation. What is IPOS? Talked about it last week. A little bit. It's amazing and humbling how feeble the human mind can be, right? It's like, oh my god, really? This is my head? I was exposed to this last week and I cannot remember what is going on. But it's also phenomenal 
32. No, I don't have a need for it anymore. And then supercomputers. Supercomputers, to go with my analogy, would be like the FBI or the CIA, right? They're, you know, or the government, like, they could just come in and, you know, obliterate the guy who owns the football team. He would just disappear in the middle of the night, nobody would know what happened to him. So that's like a supercomputer, generally owned by large educational institutions or the government, right? I don't know if, maybe like Stanford, I don't know. Like Lawrence Livermore Laboratory, uh, on the way to San Francisco in Livermore, right? You go over the hill, past the windmills, and then there's Livermore. There's a supercomputer there. Like that's how not prevalent they are. Like there's one at Liv Lawrence Livermore Lab Nuclear Laboratory. Okay. And it's just like a massive computer that can simulate a nuclear explosion on a molecular level down to the smallest molecule. How much mass, how much momentum does this molecule get when the explosion occurs? What happens to that molecule? Does it hit other molecules? Do you track and trace all those molecules? That's super. Five generations of computers. We learned that computers run on electricity. Electricity has two states. On and off. And if I have one, one light bulb or one circuit, right? One circuit that can be turned on or off. By the way, is anybody like, is anybody like, um, anybody not got the textbook? Let me see your hands. Okay. And that's fine, because I was like, you know, get the 13th edition, so I'm sure you're probably waiting for it to come from Amazon. So if there's anybody who struggles financially, Come see me after class. I've got an extra copy. And if there's a couple of you, we get a play hopscotch to see who gets it or something. All right? So if anybody's like, man, you know, you're working, paying rent, got a job, come up afterwards. That's what I would consider, you know. Uh, you know if you're, if it's hard to get textbooks, you know. Five generations of computers. So here, the first generation ran on vacuum tubes. This is what they look like. In the 40s, World War II, don't break them, they're valuable. Uh, they ran on vacuum tubes. That was first generation. Right? 18,000 of those in the first computer. First generation. They burned out. Second generation ran on transistors. Look at the change in size. This is again just a circuit that can be checked whether it's on or off, open or closed. What a difference in size, right? These guys didn't burn out and they ran much cooler. Well, you can include a lot more of these, you know, in a computer. So we started to get a lot more on-off switches. You can pass those around. <clears throat> Make sure you guys get these back up to me when they've gone the rounds. So that's second generation of computers. Third generation of computers. Now these used to be circles, but they've been broken as I pass them around. They can't be sharp, so pass them gently and uh, don't cut yourself. And if you look on them, if you hold them to the light, thanks, man. Did it make it all the way to the back? Okay, so let's make this all the way to the back. We have, we have one time. That's all right, just keep going now. Third generation of computers, silicon wafers, chips, integrated circuits. If you hold these to the light, you'll see on one side it's just kind of like this really pretty blue, and on the other side you'll see a city grid. You'll see a city grid. And each of those little blocks in the city grid is a chip. Now in each of those chips, maybe two trillion circuits that could be turned on or off and red, hey, is that on or off? So you start thinking about storing data for anything. Text, colors in a picture, you know, colors in a video, sound, right? And you could start to store all those zeros and ones. If there's two, you could store two trillion zeros and ones on something that is literally so, 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 so small. It's crazy. Third generation computers. This is an example of kinesthetic learning, right? Visual, 
auditory, hemostatic, you're actually touching them. So. so that's the third generation of computers. What's the fourth generation? Microchip? CPU. Microchip is third. Integrate circuits, microchip, chip, uh, silicon wafers. They're built on silicon wafers. That's third. Fourth generation is the CPU. I don't have a CPU. All right, but the CPU just kind of brought up a bunch of important pieces together to the same location, so it could do processing more effectively. And then fifth generation of computers is still a big question mark. People are like, we don't know. Some people say it's uh, artificial intelligence. Maybe it's connectivity. Who knows? A network. All right, so everybody clear on that? A network is nothing more. Thanks, man. Thank you. Thank you. Network is nothing more than uh, two or more devices connected together. So often we think about networks in relation to, um, you know, like a bunch of computers connected together, but you can network with two devices. There are all kinds of networks. There's networks with computers, there's networks with cellular phones, right? The cellular phone network. Um, so anything, two or more devices connected together is a network. The internet is different from the World Wide Web. The internet is the largest network in the world. You can think of the internet as the hardware. It's the actual physical infrastructure, the cables, the lines, the fiber optic cables, you know, the servers, all that stuff. That's the internet. The World Wide Web is a piece of software. It's a service that's running on all that hardware. Okay? The internet was actually created in the late 60s. And uh, then kind of got transferred to academia in the 80s. It was a product of DARPA. It was originally called the DARPA Net. DARPA stands for the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency. DARPA is still an organization that does all kinds of advanced research projects along the lines of defense, military purposes. Okay? And uh, so you could see all kinds of interesting things. Like they have the DARPA, DARPA you know, a grand challenge of having a car drive on its own, which I forget, Stanford entered and then won and then Google worked with Stanford, I think, and they developed a car which they have driven 165,000 miles around California and it's driven by itself. Like the engineers are just riding in it and the car is driving itself. Like that's DARPA, like wow. You know, they, they are working on like stuff and this is just what they talk about. Like, they created a hummingbird, remote control hummingbird. And some people might say, well, that's kind of chintzy, you know? But it's like, well, you're out in a garden somewhere. Are you going to notice a hummingbird? And a hummingbird, well, that's just kind of like the Wright brothers, right? That's kind of like the first biplane, you know, biplane plane, you know? And after that, maybe it's going to be, you know, a butterfly. And then after that, maybe it's going to be you know, a, a bumblebee, and then after that, it'll be a fly, and then after that, it'll be a mosquito. You know, in the boardroom, in the government office, recording videos, sending video back. That's DARPA. That's the internet. An ISP is an internet service provider. That's who you buy internet from. An IP address is basically every computer connected to the internet has an address. And just like every house has an address, and uh, the address is called the Internet Protocol Address, the IP address, and usually it's a series of numbers, well it is a series of numbers separated by dots. So it would be like 123.94.82.116 or something. So it's four numbers between 0 and 256 separated by three dots. That's your IP address. Domain names and URLs. The domain, domain name is the name of a website. That could also be known as a URL. Those are interchangeable. URL stands for Uniform Resource Locator. Okay? So coke.com, you go to coke.com, that's a domain name. But really what that's doing is it's resolving to an IP address. Because that server that serves up the information for the coke.com website, to find it, you need to know its internet protocol address. So when you enter coke.com, Coke.com gets resolved by a domain name server. There's something called a domain name server that looks up, okay, Coke.com, what IP address do I go to to get that information? 
Because it's much easier to remember Coke.com or Yahoo or Google than it is to remember, hey, come check out my website. It's 129.32.76.94. People are like, I can't remember that. But you say, hey, come check out my website. It's T. Scott McCloud. People are like, cool, I'll go to T. Scott McCloud and check that out. Right? But when you type in T. Scott McCloud, what happens in the background is that T. Scott McCloud is looked up at a domain name server, a DNS server. The IP address is found. The, the server goes to that IP address, asks that IP address, give me the home page for that website, and then the home page is given and you see that. So that's the difference between IP addresses and domain names slash URLs. And we talked about the benefits and the risks of the computer uh, and computers quite a bit. And I think that's the most hugely important thing about maybe this entire class, is just kind of bringing awareness to technology being a tool and how do we use it, or does it use us. And then finally, this chapter one talks about how computers are everywhere. They're ubiquitous and pervasive. Ubiquitous means something is everywhere. It's ubiquitous. It's everywhere. Ubiquitous is every, means everywhere. That's chapter one. Ugh. All right. You may have any thoughts or questions about all that. All right, got some silicon wafers coming back up. Some chips, or some microchips, or some integrated circuits, all the same thing. All energy. Uh, so, like, I just gave you guys a big chunk of information, and I imagine your brains are a little bit woo, right? Because you can't—you can only take in so much at once. It's like you can't just keep doing curls at the gym, right? You gotta do some curls and you gotta rest, and then you do some pull-ups and then you rest, and then you do some sit-ups and then you rest. Uh, so let's take a little bit of a rest, and let's—you guys want to see the preview for this movie, the one about the Stasi thing? How many people are interested? The lives of others. You want to see the preview? Okay. How many people are not interested? All right. So hit the light. War for war. I don't see a conflict at all of being a man of faith and a man of science. Well, you want to sell us something then? Ah, you want to sell us Mormonism. One of the greatest movies I've seen in a while. Uh, go ahead and hit the all the lights. Let's do all the lights. Yeah, so uh, really fantastic. But it's one of those foreign films. You got to read it. You saw it? Yep. Yeah. What do you think? It's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. Huh? I love the. I love it. Just the all of it. Yeah. I won't spoil it for those of you who haven't seen it. But check it out. You can Netflix it or Amazon. I'm sure you guys are probably aware that you could go to Amazon now just with your computer. And if you hook your computer up to your, uh, you go unlimited instant videos here and uh, Amazon instant video store. And if you hook your computer up to uh, your TV with an HDMI table, HDMI cable, right? You could uh, watch it instantly and just streams. How many people knew that already? Only a few, good. You know, Netflix is streaming movies now too. So that also works. But here you just buy it, you know, buy one movie. And so to buy the movie's ten bucks, but to watch it, I don't know what it costs. Some you rent, I guess, and some you buy. Yeah. All right, so let's take uh, let's take thirty minutes and just work on assignments, and then after that, we'll see if uh, you guys are ready for some more information. Okay. So next thirty minutes, just work on your assignments. Turn your computers on.
All right, so like 30 more seconds, and then I'm going to tell you about Moore's Law. <laughs> Moore's Law. And when I say 30 more seconds, I mean uh, you're kind of getting to the place where you can stop, and then you're going to power your computer off. And time. So we talked about the uh, five generations of computers. The first generation of computers is characterized by vacuum, vacuum tubes. Second generation of computers is characterized by transistors. transistors. Third generation of computers is characterized by yeah, silicon chips, integrated circuits. And the fourth generation is characterized by yeah, CPUs. So here are the here are the transistor counts for CPUs from 1971 to 2008. And you can see it's a pretty linear curve going up in that way. In 1971, the first CPU had 2,300 transistors, meaning 2,300 on-off switches in it, 1971. And 2008 had 2 trillion. 2 trillion switches in it, on and off, can be turned on and off. Okay, so that, that is a prediction that this guy Gordon Moore, who's one of the founders of Intel, right, uh, said that every year, he said this like in the late 60s, every, every, every year and a half, every 18 to 20 months, every 18, so this is Moore's law, every 18 to 20 months, the processing power of technology for your dollar is going to double, meaning what a buck can buy today in 18 months it's going to buy twice as much processing power. So that's Moore's law. All right? And why, why is uh, Moore's law important? Because sometimes people say, hey, man, I'm having a problem with my computer. I was hoping you could help me out. But you might hit the front lights just so hopefully people in the online class can see this. Yep, hit the other way, both of them on. Thank you very much. Uh, sometimes people say to me, hey, I'm having a problem with my computer. Can you help me out? You know what's going on with it? It's just not running like it used to. Used to? Well, what do you mean? Well, like when I got it, you know, it ran great, and now it's not running like it used to. Well, when did you get it? I don't know, not that long ago. Well, like, how long ago? Like maybe three or four years ago? Well, that's kind of a long time in computer time, and I'm going to show you why, okay? So if I buy a computer and it, and it has a capability of one, all right, and then... And then, and then 18 months go by, 18 months, and now computers are going to have a capability. The computers that are coming out are going to have twice as much capability. Processing power is doubled. And Moore's Law, by the way, has held ever since the late 60s. Moore's Law has held. And then another 18 months go by, right? And now how powerful are the computers that are coming out going to be? Four, because it doubled again. So in only three years, computers that are coming out are four times more powerful than the one you bought three years ago. Okay, so if this computer just allegorically, I don't know if that's the right word, metaphorically, that's a better word. If this computer metaphorically was designed to lift 100 pounds, okay, computers that are coming out today can lift 400 pounds. And the software that's written for these computers is 400 pound software. So the software that's coming out three years later is being written for today's computers, which are four times more powerful than your computer. And so those computers know how to lift 400 pounds, so it's writing heavier software that requires more processing, akin to maybe lifting 400 pounds. And here's your old wimpy computer that can only lift 100 pounds trying to lift 400 pounds. So no wonder it's struggling, metaphorically speaking, right? And then give it 18 more months, and less than, right, five years, and under five years, the computers that are coming out are eight times more powerful than that computer that you bought four years and six months ago. Four years and six months, and computers are eight times more powerful. So that's Moore's Law. So, you know, in four years, it's kind of like, ah, oh, that's an old computer. It's a pretty old computer. You're trying to run today's software on that computer, 
No wonder it's not running so well. It's bogging out. Because today's computers can lift 800 pounds, and your computer is built to lift 100 pounds. So that's kind of like the implication of Moore's Law. How many people are like, oh, well, that's a cool way to look at it. I never understood that before. All right. So that's why, like, in four years, ah, it's time to start thinking about a new computer. All right, uh, hit the front lights for me again, please. So I just wanted to show you guys a few of the PowerPoints from the textbook. I generally don't like the PowerPoints from the textbook because they have so much gosh darn text on them. All right? It's like, oh, my God, do you want to read all that? Like, half of you aren't listening to me anymore because you're reading all the text on the screen. And this is actually, you know, a good point to illustrate, right? When you put a PowerPoint presentation together, that's kind of the extent of what you want to be showing your audience. You know, you don't really want to give them too much stuff. Because if you give them a bunch of stuff, they lo you lose them and they start reading it. But anyhow, so, you know... What I want to, why am I even showing you this then? <laughs> it's talking about on and off and bits and binary digits, you know, and the decimal and binary number system. And here's ASCII. So here's talking about a coding system for text, right? And so there's an ASCII coding system, and it talks about EBCDIC, which is another coding system. And then there's Unicode, which is the third coding system for text. And it's 32 bits, 30, 32 bits per pack, for per character. And so that means it could store just like a ton of information, right? Like 32 bits at Google. Let's go to Google. No, not Gmail. I'm going to go to Google. And if we have 2 to the power of 32, right, a 32-bit coding scheme can have 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, those are millions, 4,294,967,296 different things stored. So one, a one bit could store two things. A 32 bit coding system can store four, what is that, million? And that's billion, four billion things. So uh, Unicode, FCDIC, and uh, ASCII, three text coding systems. Here's a coding system for pictures. Okay, and a variety of bit depths are possible. Four, eight, 24 bits. More bits equals more colors. So let's look at that. Right, so if one pixel here only has four bits, right? If each pixel has four bits, how many different colors can we use for each pixel? Like we're only using four bits to store the color information. How many possible colors? If we have four bits. Two to the fourth would be two times two is four times two is eight times two is 16. So we have 16 different colors, right? So that'd be a 16 color image. So each little picture element, each pixel could be one of 16 colors. If we had eight bits for each pixel, we, if we have eight bits to store the color information for each pixel, then we could have 256, right? 2 to the 8. 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256. And if we have uh, true color, which is what? 24 bits. With 24 bits, we could have each pixel could be one of 16.8 million possible colors. If we use a 24 bit uh, coding scheme to represent each color. So when we take a picture with our digital camera, each little dot, each pixel, the camera says what color is closest to that and picks from a palette of colors that's 16.8 million different colors. It says, oh, it's this exact shade of blue. And then it stores that series of zeros and ones, 24 zeros and ones, for that one little dot, for that one little dot. So if this picture is in size, like 1,000 pixels wide, and it's 2,000, let's say it's 2,000 pixels wide, and it's 1,000 pixels tall, well then there are 2 million pixels. 2 million pixels. And if each pixel can store 24 zeros and ones, right, we are storing 48 million 
48 million zeros and ones to capture the information for one picture. 48 million zeros and ones. Wow. Wow. 48 million zeros and ones to store the data for one picture? Holy cow, that's a lot, right? Well, what is that? Instead of it being in just bits, binary digits, how many zeros and ones, how many bytes is that? Well, there's eight bytes to every bit, so that's uh, six, six million bytes. Well, how many kilobytes is that? Right? Well, there's a uh, thousand bytes in every kilobyte, so that's 6,000 kilobytes. Okay, well, how many megabytes is that? Well, there's a thousand megabytes in every kilobyte, so that's six megabytes. Yeah, that doesn't sound so big now, six megabytes. But what six megabytes really translates to is 48 million zeros and ones. One picture? One picture. And so that's where it becomes mind-blowing, right? Like, what does a computer do? Well, a computer runs on electricity. And just like a light bulb can store two pieces of information, whether it's on or off, just multiply that up and scale. And if you have a couple of light bulbs, if you have three light bulbs, you could store, arrange those three light bulbs in different combinations of on and off to store a meaning of eight different things. If it's in this combination, it means the letter A. This combination, the letter B. Right? Well, what if we have 24 light bulbs? So I'll put them in this configuration of on and off, and it means this color. And put them in this configuration of on and off, and it means that color. And then do that for every dot in a picture. Actually, there's going to be, in this picture, 1,000 by 2,000. So that's going to be, you know, uh, what do we say, 2 million? 2 million dots. Do that for 2 million dots and store 24 zeros and ones for each dot. And we can store all the color for a picture with just light bulbs being on and off. Are you crazy? Did you lose your mind? You want to try to invent that? That's the most insane idea I've ever heard in my life. That sounds impossible to invent. No, I think we can do it. You're crazy. That's computers, right? It's just a bunch of on and off switches, a bunch of zeros and ones, storing data. So one of the guys who's, uh, who created supercomputers, Alan Cray, asked this question, and he said, uh, I think it's him. Would you rather have chickens or Alan Cray? Let's see if that brings it up. What would you rather have to plow a field? Two strong oxen or 1,024 chickens? All right, so that, he is a guy who worked on supercomputers, and that was his question. And you know, the, the idea behind that statement is if you could use the 1,024 chickens correctly, you could do a lot more than with two oxen. I don't know. That's kind of maybe not the best metaphor or analogy, but it's the idea that a bunch of little things like zeros and ones can do something amazing. How many people think that's amazing? How many people that gave you a little bit more insight into that entire on-off switch thing and how it's all working? All right. So I will see you guys on Thursday. Don't forget to turn in your cards.